Welcome back, everybody. So this is the uh, exciting part of the evening where we're going to have our poetic opener and our featured reader. Our poetic opener for this evening is Eva Kolach. And Eva has published three poetry collections and is a professional painter whose artworks are in private collections. Uh, Ontario Archives and National Museums of Poland. She immigrated to Canada as a refugee in 1981, leaving Poland, then ruled by Soviet Union, because the voices of artists and writers were censored. And we're very fortunate to welcome Eva to the open mic to read, well, not the open mic, the poetic opener uh, spot this evening. Let's give her a warm hand. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to, to read from three poems from my three books. And uh, all of the covers are made, I mean, the, my in, art is appearing on the, on the covers over here and also my paintings over there. So I will start with poem from my book, Solace. If grief would go down the river, daily routine, at first, there is a kind of daily routine, the gentle teasing, one sweep after another. Your eyes follow the stray of waves without realizing that on return, they could strike you with a punch, lucky mercy. The play. Grief rises to play, pushing you to run, so you run. It follows you to where the running had started a minute ago, like the other time, down the river. If the grief would go down the river, along the twists and weeds, down the rocks to the place of rest, then I would consider myself the lucky one. A new beginning. A new way stretches in front of us when the wonder becomes the will. Sometimes the journey seems too long. Make sure not to run backwards. Now, this is the book a collaborative book with Lawrence, my husband, Lawrence Hutchman. I did illustration uh, based on Chagall's painting. My interpretation a little bit is here. And also I illustrated this book uh, with my illustration here. So I'm going, because it's a lot, they love poems, I'm going to read poem dedicated to Lawrence, uh, one of the poems of his in this book. Be with me. What is keeping me here in the silent room of early April? Is this picture in my mind featuring our heart's joyous feast? And my body's willingness to wait for you, or just this night, resembling a dark green forest, calmly invited me to lie down. You brought poems to keep me company, but in the rhythmic flow of your words, I'm the bird with paper wings burning 
in there. The last poem is from Whatever We Are, a book. And I was recently, all of us are watching news and we strike about what's going on. And also we think about soldiers, with the people who are suffering. Um, when I was looking, uh, what to read, suddenly this poem arrived and I thought this is the one to finish my reading. Mission. The future is created by our actions in the present. Deepak Chopra. Far away from home in the patchwork of abandoned streets your eyes sense nonsense of the situation, casting pain in the dusted air. And I ask you to read my lips, beloved, the words that can elevate you with your feet still on the ground. Let me take off your animal skin with its hunger for, for fresh blood. Take off from your face the novel notion painted by powerful men of Shakespearean character, talking of peace when thinking of war and playing gods in leisure. Don't try to identify me. My name is among your people. I'm painfully yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. It was wonderful to hear you read from your beautiful books. Patrick Friesen sent me such a very, very tiny, humble bio. And so I had to go and rewrite it. <laughs> Patrick Friesen is a poet playwright, essayist, filmmaker, and translator who has published more than a dozen books of poetry, a book of essays, stage and radio plays, and has translated with Per, ba per Brask five books of Danish poetry, including Frayed Opus for Strings and Wind Instruments by Ulrika Gennis, which was shortlisted for the Griffin Poetry Prize. His book, Blasphemer's Wheel, was awarded Manitoba Book of the Year. A Broken Bowl was finalist for the Governor General's Award. And Jumping in the Asylum, I love that book, won the Reelit Award for Poetry. Patrick has also collaborated with choreographers, dancers, musicians, and composers. And most recently has released the, the collaborative CD, Bunsen's Bell, with Nico Friesen and Outlasting the Weather, Selected and New Poems, and the newest book, which is a, a long poem in book form, I believe, called Reckoning. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome Patrick Friesen. Right, hi. Thank you, there. That's it. Right up next week. <laughs> and thank you, Paul, for coming out here. And to Russell Books for hosting these events. This is, um, yeah, a long poem, but it's broken into 175 sections. So I'm going to give a little context. I don't know how we do this, but probably needs it. 175 sections, some as short as one line, some page and a half. I've utilized prose, poetry, and dialogue. As you know, each of those has its own strengths and flaws. So I just let myself use whatever genre I needed for what I was trying to do that day. And I really didn't care what the results would be. After a while, I saw the threats 
And the cover, which was designed by my daughter, Marika, indicates the main thread. This is um, a drawing by a physicist in 1600 in England. Gilbert was his last name. He designed this to help sailors not have to use the sun and stars to navigate. And so that was an early distancing from the way human beings had navigated. And in fact, the title reckoning comes from dead reckoning, which was a South Pacific form of mental and physical navigation. Those sailors would have a mental picture of what they were leaving and of what they wanted to get to. Plus, they had a tremendous knowledge of the ocean, its colors, how it changed the currents, what was carried by what currents, relationship to the sky. And I always hit those places. And of course, there have been song lines and other methods. Can you imagine singing your way through a landscape? People have done that. And maybe poets try to do that. Now, there are many kinds of navigation. Um, the physical that I've just referred to, but, and mental. There are spiritual navigations. There are familial navigations. Some of us have to navigate harder than others, depending on our families. Mm -hmm. um, there's navigation through memory and story and the relationship between those two. Story becoming memory, becoming story sometimes. Um, so you don't know anymore what the real memory was. Navigation through time, and this book moves back and forth through time. So I will try and navigate through this reading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Means jumping around in the pages. Small in all that blossoming, settled on a branch in the magnolia, the bird that sometimes hovers before my face, eyeball to eyeball, sussing me out, my large face and big eyed staring. The bird perched for a moment in a memory of blossoms, the slow flow of sap, an idle moment, a scent and a return until a sudden sideways slip, almost not a motion at all, the hummingbird disappearing into the mind of the dream, that opening. The bird arriving in the magnolia, waiting for the nearby Mambrisha to bloom, waiting for something sweet, waiting and hovering and vanishing the navigation of latitudes and winds, of the scent of endless gardens, of updrafts and rivers, and the map of that tiny body from matter to mind and navigation. Dogs howled at the moment the sun died. The town eclipsed, almost lit, almost not. And the man said that I must pray for forgiveness. And for what I asked, I haven't murdered the son. And he said, it isn't funny, but of course it was. The man holding his Bible against my forehead as if my skull was porous, mangling some language. And those great secular bodies kept rolling through all that vastness and birds were silent just for a moment. And the world hushed, except for the man's uncertain tears as he pushed me out of his car and drove into the sun's profane rebirth. I had no direction, only a way. A hairpin falling to the floor, her hair undone, and nothing the same again. So the story goes, the story the man told over the years, the story he heard of his young mother drowning in her lungs and calling, terrified, the room turning, and someone closing the blinds to keep something out, perhaps the rooster at dawn. This is what was remembered 
in all the agitation. It was November 1918 and him becoming an orphan. A dog barked all night. That too was remembered, though it had nothing to do with anything. Swimming out of the pass, a fishbone caught in my throat. There may be nothing after death. I tend toward that, or everything, but I doubt it. Someone singing through an open window, this I know. There are those who sing their way through the landscape, and there are birds that sing to their eggs, like women to their wombs, singing spirit out of water. There are rivers to cross. It's an old song. Sing it. A lament for Maria carried past the window on the shoulders of four men on the way to her grave. Sing it for the child she suckled on her deathbed in 1918. A mother, but already a grandmother, long before grandchildren were born and none of us remembering her. Sing it for Anna in her passion, caught in the river, the woman who gave birth to a grandfather, her only child, my grandfather, with a player's plane between his fingers, never revealing the secret of the river, but telling stories. Crossing rivers, the rat, red, the sane, and always a last river, watching it flow out of time. Sing it, row, row, row your boat. Gwendolyn McEwen's eyes were dark stones with the fullness of the earth in them, like the fallen eyes of angels with everything they'd seen of mystery and doubt, her still walking down Bloor, looking for the secret room. At least that's how it seems some days. Such intensity doesn't vanish quickly. It leaves an aura behind or a faint pillar of light. Not either or, but between, or rather, both, juggling yes and no from hand to hand, maybe, wanting nothing more than that, living between, along the arc of an Ajinsky leap, that hanging arc, which is now, the palm of the body, a step, silent hands, an aging face, the absence between steps, Her head is low to the keyboard, a fall of hair over one eye. Learner plays through some genetic story. Among the changes of tempo, the turns and detours, I hear familiar sounds, what I thought I had left and my leaving. Music is a window. I see a figure behind the drapes, a deer at the edge of a clearing. I see a wintry road beneath moonlight. I remember someone sang about moonlight shining through the trees. And music is a mirror. It's not much to say about that. The last chord sustains and Lerner straightens to full posture. It's the way she can disappear and return. Her fingers translating and us breathing inside that transition. It's that conjury I love.
nothing sacred in it about songs or words, no scriptures there. Just moments of transition. Profane blessings, spirits in the flesh, rope walking between earth and stars. Eve, absolutely still, leaning forward, fingers motionless on the keyboard, her eyes staring the words into extinction until they finally come alive. The topography of mind, finding a way into the poem, naming what the feet touch, the mouth saying the babble of the mind. All those sounds we've made. Working at night when distance diminishes, listening to the sound of rain, and you clear your throat, let it rain. Fully clothed, she descended the staircase, somehow losing her clothes on a landing halfway down, which is where I greeted her, all motion slowing to a kiss. And that was motion. Only now is it memory or the idea of it. Us meeting in a house I no longer remember except for the stairs. How I got there and how I came away. There were clothes scattered on descending steps. It was motion, you know, because time passed. I have become the slack-assed old man I used to watch at the gym four decades ago. Not daughtery yet, living inside someone's ancient skin, wondering where I've been. I have tracked an animal all my life, following its spoor, moving between foot and mind, getting close, but never more than glimpses at night. Moonlit eyes in a thicket, and nothing there at first light but scat. Lost in my age until I find the track again, and learning how quickly the weather can turn out there in the places I walk through and in here. I am fortunate to have been lazy. Them frogs are leaving. Won't know them soon. Disappear down warm rivers to some cove of lost things. The bear turning away. Bones of her cubs lying in the blanched field. Us too. Thinned out through heat and rising rivers. And vanishing. It will come to pass. Yes, by our own hands. A trawler on its side in the desert, or cities disappearing beneath waters. About time, someone said, meaning they had run out of patience. But I was thinking it might mean a much bigger thing, for impatience has no meaning. But I forget what came after that. Out of time is what it's come to now closer to the end than to the middle, but also something about the journey, what we emerged from, creatures that we were on that arm dangling simian path. It is about time, that drip, drip of seconds that takes no time at all. And who remembers us critters Vanishing with the last word or two of comfort or conciliation, or perhaps only a silence broken by traffic, or a nurse fiddling with an IV. Yes, it's all about time, something to unearth, always to unearth it. What I heard was the monk observing his vowels. I imagined a chapel with rosy light from high windows crossing a stone floor, the monk chanting, 
air entering his mouth, down the trachea to his lungs, and then back out again. A kind of hallucinatory poem that repeated the cycle of air shaped by its passage into Gregorian song. I saw the oblong O of his mouth, like the mouth of a dying man. I've seen that, and I've known that long last exhalation of breath, that abandonment. Like William Blake singing hymns as he died, his joyful mouth open as a vowel, his breath released like a vowel. That's really weird. Yeah, what? I just had deja vu. Oh yeah, it happens. What was it? I had deja vu about having had deja vu. <laughs> That's interesting. It's probably happened before. You think? The deja vu I just had a deja vu about was a deja vu about a previous deja vu. <laughs> wow, so that's what? Three deja vus about deja vu? It won't happen again. I thought you'd say that. <laughs> well, she said, I remember, and she meant, let me tell you a story. And I listened and said, it's not exactly how you told it before. And she said, of course not. You're younger with different ears. So which one is true, or at least truer? And she said, yes. A hummingbird on a barbed wire fence. And you remember a dirt road and a distant figure approaching. An old woman who stopped before you and you halted, trying to read her beautiful hands, the world suddenly alive within her silent gestures. Collapsing mind. One day, like any solar system collapses, unable to hold together, returning to random. Is that a question? Memories frayed or grown until finally undone. The knitting unraveling into a spidery chaos in the floor. Let me tell you one thing, uh, but wait, I've forgotten. There are too many things flickering in my brain. Worn thoughts. Images skittering like stones across water, and they sink. An old woman is walking in the heat. She is not walking toward an oasis. They have all dried out. She is looking for the last tree, carrying the mind of the species to the end of the earth. Man is memorizing poems on his deathbed. There's one by Auden and Emily Dickinson. Of course, some Shakespeare sonnets, but he keeps returning to a poem by Yeats. All day he sleeps, at night he can be heard murmuring the poems, a line of light beneath the door. Where does he think he's carrying these poems to? Sometimes he takes on the voices in the Yeats poem of Crazy Jane and the Bishop. A small drama on his narrow bed. Something to remind him of Earth. An unholy passport. Some pick huckleberries. Some pluck stars from the sky. What's the difference? The season, our brief bodies are burning cattails with blackbirds rising like smoke, always indecipherable, 
the vastness of a sky with its million detonations, unnoticed disappearances, and us moving through it all, what is glimpsed in the corner of the eye, an augenblick, some detail, an Icelandic poppy, or another life walking by, and we walk like Kierkegaard through the streets of Copenhagen, mulling his morning's work, Thoreau sauntering perpetually towards some holy land, like Dickinson walking up and down the stairs between the kitchen and her room, between conversation and a brief visitation of the poem. And we walk like Virginia Woolf, gathering stones on her way to the river, a long walk to the river ooze. And the ones who walk at night, insomniacs and the anxious, pausing in bus shelters to get out of the rain. A woman I know crosses the blue bridge, seeking some elusive phrase or finite word. And when the word arrives, she keeps walking, a spill of joy through her body. She walks further, leaving the bridge behind. There is infinity in those shoes, in the long miles, in the bend, a man looking for the place where night is buried. Holding the baby's bare foot, that unbelievably soft skin, the hand's mind remembering. Another ship sailing, land hold. Well, maybe, maybe not. Wind blowing my hat away. All hands on deck. Oh, baby, what a wonder. Thanks. <laughs>